My name is Jennifer Myers. I'm with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'm a conservation biologist out of our Lakeland Regional Office, and I work in southwest Florida, which for me covers Brooksville down to Punta Gorda, and then over to the Kissimmee River. So much further south of here is our south, uh, south region, but I do work quite a bit in this area. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the Florida bonneted bat. So when I say bat, um, most people get the heebie-jeebies. They don't like bats. They think they're creepy. They just oh, start rubbing their hair. I know I'm talking to a group of folks that are more conservation-minded than the average person, so hopefully at least some of you, um, when I say bat, maybe you think, oh, how cute. Oh, how neat. So I'm coming into it hoping that I'm, I'm talking to people that are more interested than the general public. But it is, um, it is a problem that we face when we're trying to teach people about um, species like the Florida bonneted bat when they have these preconceived notions of bats in general. So today we're gonna, I'm going to try in the short period of time that I have to give you guys an introduction to bats in Florida, talk a little bit about the Florida bonneted bat, um, some things that my agency and other folks are doing for the species, and then hopefully provide you with some opportunities to get involved. So in Florida, we have about 20 different species of bats. Bats are mammals. They're flying mammals. Um, they're nocturnal, so they're only active at night. They're a very interesting group of animals um, that some people spend their whole life studying and still are finding out new things every day. I myself am not a bat biologist. I've sort of... Um, uh, just wandered into this specialty simply because of my work in Florida with the Florida bonneted bat. But there's so much about bats that makes them so unique, so I'm hoping that I can sh share some of that with you today. Um, we have 13 bats in Florida that are residents, which means they live here year-round, they breed here, they have established populations. And then we have seven that we call accidental, which means they maybe blew here in a hurricane, they caught a ride on a boat, um, they're not breeding here, and we're not quite sure why they found their way here in the first place. Um, three of the species that live in Florida are federally endangered, the Indiana bat, the gray bat, and the Florida bonneted bat. Um, bats are insect eaters in Florida. Around the world, bats eat many different things. Some are fruit eaters, some eat fish, some eat small mammals, um, reptiles and amphibians, and of course the vampire bats that do eat the blood of their prey. But in, in, in Florida, all we have are the insect eaters. And one single bat can eat up to 3,000 insects in a single night of foraging. And in Florida, we have more foraging nights than they do elsewhere in the United States because of our nice um, warm winters. So you can see the economic benefit of eating that many insects. And these are uh, in areas and neighborhoods. Uh, they're going to help with insect control in better ways than by spraying chemicals, for, for example. Um, the way that our Florida bats find their insects, um, they hunt them at night using echolocation. So this is going to be similar to sonar, um, where they send out an echolocation call and it bounces off of things in their environment, whether that's an insect or a tree they need to avoid flying into, in some cases maybe a power line or a pole. And that um, echolocation call bounces back and, and they're able to interpret what's in front of them. If it's moving in a certain way, they know that it's an insect and they focus in on it to go and eat it. Um, if you ever wondered why bats are so weird looking, which I know that they are, they have these crazy ears, crazy noses, weird little faces, it's because that echolocation call comes right back at their face and they use all of that surface area to interpret the information that they get back and they're able to better perceive where their prey items are. Each bat species has its own separate echolocation call, and this is a major way that we identify them. Um, we have equipment that can record those calls and look at it on a computer screen, and since each call is unique, we can tell which species is which. It's a little bit easier than going out and trying to catch the bats and identify them in hand. Um, bats in Florida use roosts. I'm going to say roosts and colony a few more times today, so I want to clarify what I mean. A roost provides a bat with a resting place that's safe. It's protected from predators. It's protected from the elements. It also can provide opportunities for socializing and for reproduction. So bat, uh, a given bat species may have the same roost every night, or it may move between roosts on given nights. Um, some bats roost alone, so they're solitary, and some bats roost in colonies. Um, notably, the Brazilian free-tailed bat can roost in colonies of several hundred thousand bats. And if you're driving on I-75 going north or south, just about every overpass that you go under is going to have bats in it. Um, 
Roof structures, like I said, could inc include bridges, caves, not quite so much the caves in South Florida, palm fronds and Spanish moss, tree cavities and snags, buildings and bat houses. Some of these are ideal for bats. Um, bat houses are built specifically for them. Snags, tree cavities, palm fronds, these are all natural places that they can find shelter. Um, bats in buildings is another question. A lot of times people don't want bats in buildings and so the FWC has rules and regulations for how you can deal with them if they're in your attic or in, in another business where they're not desired. Um, as far as reproduction goes, in general, bats in Florida have a maternity season. We're just outside the maternity season now. It starts in the middle of April and it runs through the middle of August. And this is when the females will give birth and they'll raise their pups. So that's what a young bat is called. During the maternity season, Florida law prohibits excluding bats from a roost. The females come and go throughout the night to feed their pups when they can't fly. And so if bats are roosting in an attic and they, can't, they, they all leave and they can't get back in, then the, the pups will die. And that's why we have the rules for protecting them during the maternity season. So now we'll go on to the Florida bonneted bat. The bonneted bat is the largest bat species in Florida. In my opinion, it's one of the cutest. You can see here, um, the top photo shows, let's see, we have a bonneted bat up here, that's a, and the ruler shows you it's about five inches in length. The second photo on the bottom shows a Florida bonneted bat next to a Brazilian free-tailed bat, which is a species that is occupying many of the bridges around here. And the bonneted bat, you can see, is easily two times, maybe even three times bigger than the free-tailed bat. Um, all of our bats in Florida are significantly smaller than the bonneted bat, so it's a really easy um, diagnostic uh, feature of the species. You can also see uh, the free tail, so they have a tail that extends past that membrane. Some bats have a membrane that goes all the way to the end of the tail and some don't. And if you, um, I was working with bonneted bats just a couple weeks ago and I was trying to explain to somebody what that meant. And we were watching a bat climb up a tree and they said it looked like he was wearing a Snuggie and his tail stuck out the bottom of the Snuggie. So if you can use that as an illustration, their tail is a little bit longer and it's not encased in their wing membrane. Um, some differences about Florida bonneted bats um, compared to the rest of the species in Florida. So their echolocation call that they use to learn about their landscape as they're flying around, it's audible to some people. And I say some, if you've taken care of your hearing over the years, it's likely, oh, and if you're under the age of 40, it's likely that you can hear them. Um, I've noticed that people over 40 or people who've maybe shot a few too many shotguns, ridden on a few too many airboats, they have a pretty hard time picking up the call. But it's a very distinctive call and it's at a low enough decibel that you can hear it if you have good hearing. And this is significant because there's no other bat species in Florida that you can do this with. Um, Florida bonneted bats, we suspect they give birth outside of the known maternity season. And this is important because in South Florida, if a person has bats in their attic and they want to do an exclusion, even following state guidelines, they could inadvertently be dealing with bonneted bats if, they're not, if they don't know the difference between bonneted bats and other species. And if they're excluding according to state law, during, outside of the maternity season, they could still be impacting bonneted bats because we suspect that they give birth later in the year. Now, probably what I should do with my presentation, instead of telling you what we do know, is just highlight the things that we don't know. Because there's so much we don't know about this species. As a matter of fact, we only know of one natural roost that was found very recently and two other areas where the species is using bat houses. Otherwise, across the entire southern part of our state, the only way we know that bonneted bats occur in a few locations is by listening for their echolocation calls. So there's only a couple of places that you could reliably go and get a bat in hand if you were so inclined. Otherwise, we, we just don't know a whole lot about where they occur in Florida. Other things that we don't know are their social structure, exactly what do they eat, what kind of habitat do they prefer, what kind of roost do they need, what are some threats to their population. So we know very little about the species, but fortunately we're starting to learn more and more each year. So a little bit of the history of bonneted bats. Um, prior to 2004, the, they were known as the Florida Mastiff bat. So if you ever look in old literature, the old rare and endangered biota books, they refer to this species as the Florida Mastiff bat. 
And they were, it was considered a subspecies of mastiff bat, which is a fairly common species in the Keys and further south. Um, 2004, some genetic work was done that showed that the mastiff bat was actually not a subspecies, and it was classified as the Florida bonneted bat, completely unique to Florida, and would be the only species of bat that's only found in Florida. The FWC listed it um, as the Florida mastiff bat in 1992 and continued it um, as a protected species after it was renamed the Florida bonneted bat, and it's still a threatened species by the state of Florida. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was petitioned to list the Florida Mastiff bat, but they didn't find that that was warranted. However, when it was reclassified and some new information became available, they were petitioned again and finally listed it as an endangered species last October. Uh, I have a series of slides that I'm going to use to show you where the species is found in South Florida. I can't take credit for these. Um, some folks at the Florida Bat Conservancy put them together. But it's going to show you from the earliest records that we know to current date what, where we think the species occurs. And it's important to note that most of these findings are from acoustic evaluations of echolocation calls. So people going out and driving roads, walking up and down canals, holding equipment that records echolocation calls. A lot of these are not from a bat in hand experience. So the earliest record is from the fossil record all the way up in Brevard County. And we've not found any indication around that area that they still occur. Um, the next record is from Miami in 1936. And Florida bonneted bats still occur in the Miami area today. In 1979, so that's a pretty big gap from 1936 to 1979, where we didn't have any records of the species. But in 1979, a colony showed up in an old pine tree that was knocked down when they were clearing for the interstate. And this is here in Punta Gorda, actually not too far from where we are, near the Babcock Webb Wildlife Management Area, which is managed by the FWC. In 2000, so that's another pretty big gap from 1979 to 2000, um, a, some, a park ranger down in Fakahatchee Strand found an owl pellet with a skull in it and sent that in to be tested, and they found out that it was a Florida bonneted bat skull. Now, between... 1979 and 2000, several different groups of people were out looking for bonneted bats with acoustic equipment, but they didn't realize that its call was so low and their equipment could only detect from a certain level and above. And so they were searching, but they were completely unable to find it because they didn't realize that fe the feature of the unique call. So in 2003, um, in a bat house in a backyard in North Fort Myers, a lady who happens to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service saw some bats coming out of her house. She thought, this is a little weird. They look kind of big. She had just gone to see a presentation about bats, and she thought, I'm going to call the person that gave the presentation. And she called them. They said, no, it, it's got to be just a normal species. And she said, no, no, they're really big. So they came down, and they took a look, and, and sure enough, it was Florida bonneted bats. This was the first time that a colony had been found in recent history. So this sort of set off a, a landslide of research, and everybody got really excited, and the Fish and Wildlife Service spent some money to look for the species in this area. And so they did, they contracted with the Florida Bat Conservancy to do some surveys, and they added these purple stars on the map here. Um, Babcock Ranch, which is on the other side of Babcock Webb, down in Naples, Everglades City, Big Cypress, and Homestead. Um, the FWC got on board, and we did some surveys uh, on Babcock Webb, but also some of our areas to the north. And we found them at Kisso Wildlife Management Area and Platts Bluff, which are along the Kissimmee River. And this blew everybody's mind. Nobody thought that they would be this far north. And it's important to note that for the Kisso and the Platts Bluff call, uh, calls that we recorded, it was just a few calls, and we weren't able to replicate it. So we still don't know exactly what that means. And then finally, the Fish and Wildlife Service asked for more surveys in 2010 and 2012. They added some locations at Darwin's Place, which I think is a campground, and also a spot in Everglades National Park. And then in 2013, they were found at the Avon Park Air Force Range up in Avon Park, which is very close to where we documented them in 2008. And then they added them at the Panther Refuge and at Picayune. And on this map, all of these purple, yellow, and white stars show you all of the individual places where we've documented them. And you can see they're fairly spread out, and they're fairly small in number. 
And I can assure you that we've searched extensively throughout some of the other areas and have not found them. But we're not comfortable saying that they're not there. We've just not been able to find them. So I want to take the rest of my presentation to talk about some of the ongoing research and management. Um, my agency has bat houses on the Babcock Web Wildlife Management Area, which is here in Punta Gorda. And we've had bonneted bats using these houses since 2008. And they even used them for, as a maternity roost this year. So you might be thinking, well, I live down here. I have a nice backyard. I have a pond that might have some insects using it. I'm going to put up a bat house. And we're not really um, jumping to the conclusion that bat houses are the, the best recommendation just yet. Um, we're asking more questions, and we're um, going to try to do some research to determine if this is going to be the most effective management tool that we have. Um, we do monitor our bat houses seasonally. We count all the bats that use them um, as they're emerging. And it gives us an estimate of our bat house population size, which our recent estimates have been in the low 60s um, and having 60 different bats using our bat houses. We use infrared cameras to monitor them. It makes it a lot easier to see them because they emerge after dark. And it's allowed us to get some good footage of the bats. And you can see an adult bat here. It's a little fuzzy. Um, as he's fixing to emerge out of the house. Um, the FWC has been working with the University of Florida on a pit tagging project. Pit tagging stands for Passive Integrated Transponder, which is just a fancy way of talking about microchips like you might use for your pet. So we put a microchip into the bat, and then if you catch that bat again, you can scan it and get some more information about it. So we did this in April of 2014. We trapped 50 bats, and we tagged all of them. And then we went out in August just a couple weeks ago, and we trapped them again. We were able to scan and see which bats we'd already caught in April and which bats that we hadn't caught yet. And we actually went from 50 bats in April, and then we caught 62 just this past August. This project provides us with information on how they're using bat houses, how the population is doing, how much recruitment there is, how much reproduction there is. And we also found baby bats this year. When we trapped bats in April, we found many pregnant bats. So we went back several times a week after that and documented when they gave birth and got some really good footage of the babies in the bat houses, which the babies are even cuter than the adults, if you can believe it. <laughs> um, finally, I want to talk about a citizen science project that the Florida Bat Conservancy and some other partners are working on. Um, is anybody here involved in that? OK, good. Um, so, if you're interested in becoming involved, pay attention. This is a project to increase the amount of area that is surveyed for Florida bonneted bats. Um, the, Disney Wilderness, or the Disney project gave us some money, the Florida Bat Conservancy bought some equipment, and they're recruiting citizen scientists like yourself to take this equipment home, put it in your backyard, put it out where you work, leave it out for a few hours every night for a week, send them the data, and then pass along the equipment to the next person. The Florida Bat Conservancy is evaluating the data and determining if you have bonneted bats in the area where you surveyed. And uh, it's fairly low time commitment, and you can set the equipment out and leave it for a few hours and then pick it back up. You don't have to sit there and supervise it. But it's already been effective at adding to that number of stars on the map and adding the number of places that we've found them, um, even in the Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte, and Fort Myers area. So if you're interested in getting involved with um, the Citizen Science Project, I've got a contact person for you, Cindy Marks with the Florida Bat Conservancy. Um, her email is listed on the screen, and you can contact her, let her know that you heard about it through this presentation, and I'm sure she'd be happy to give you information about the project and plug you in if you're interested. Um, if you're also interested in helping me, you can volunteer to help with our bat house counts. We do them four times a year. So two times out of the year, it's pretty pleasant outside. Two times out of the year, it's pretty miserable. But we're always interested in having people come out and help us count bats as they emerge from bat houses. And you can contact me at um, my email address is listed if you're interested. And finally, if you don't have the time to do either of those or you're not necessarily over in this area, um, I would encourage you to become a bat advocate. Um, when you say bats to the general public, they get kind of weirded out, they don't love it, but tell them about how they eat so many insects a night. They actually do beneficial things for the ecosystem and how we're so um, privileged in Florida to have the Florida bonneted bat, which is one of the rarest bats in the world and is only found here in Florida. 
And I don't think I have time for questions, but if you have any pressing questions, you can come find me or contact me at my email address. Thank you.